My name is Peter Young, and I'm an animal rights activist. Well, today is my first day in Europe. I am um, on a, just a short speaking tour. I'm going to be. It's going to end at the International Animal Rights Gathering in Italy, and we just did a talk here at the Bollocks, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And it was fantastic. Yeah. Today, I was discussing um, a lot of topics related to animal rights activism and and the animal liberation movement. I discussed. Um, Animal Liberation Front Strategy, I discussed some of my personal experiences, I discussed um, a lot, I discussed the subject of fear and how I think that's our biggest enemy as a movement, um, the Animal Liberation Movement right now. Um, so I discussed a lot of topics that I feel are relevant to people who are fighting for animals. Sure, I think it's important to keep in mind that the power that a few individuals have to, to create massive change. Um, and for example, I'm going to the Inter International Animal Rights Gathering um, in Italy here in, uh, next week. And I'm told that the gathering brings out about 500 people. And I just like to think about, just to highlight the power of direct action, I like to think about if instead of all those, those 500 people going to this gathering this weekend, if they all just paired off and went to a fur farm tomorrow or went to a, a slaughterhouse or you know abattoir tomorrow um, or went to um, a factory farm tomorrow, um, you'd have 250 pairs of people going out, decommissioning um, um, horrible, horrible animal abuse facilities. Um, consider you would, there are certain countries that would not have a fur industry overnight if that were to happen. They would not have a meat industry overnight if those people were to pair off and go out and carry out um, direct action. I think that highlights the power of that type of activity of groups like the Animal Liberation Front. I discussed a little bit about prison and how um, the fear that I had of prison was much worse than, than prison itself. Um, I talked a lot about some of the lessons that I learned in prison, one of which is in prison culture, um, um, talk means absolutely nothing. And I talked about how in prison, uh, in the, the culture of prison, you don't walk up to somebody and insult them or call them a name. You either punch them in the face, you stab them, or you don't say anything at all. There's no such thing as words. Words are totally devalued, they're, they're delegitimized, and I was talking about how that's a really important lesson that we can learn as a movement in the animal liberation movement is to delegitimize talk and legitimize action. I discussed how um, as activists we have a toolbox that is unlimited if you look at our palette of, of, of tactics that we can use to achieve animal liberation, it's endless. Um, now, if you look at the opposition, you look at the government, what is the weapon they have against us? Um, the only one I can come up with is prison. That's, that's all they have. So when you look at it in those terms, we are much more powerful than they are. You know, it, there is no one right way to, to, to achieve animal liberation. I really think it's going to... You have to sort of consider your strengths. You have to consider what's um, going to be effective in a particular industry. For example, you know, direct action and the ALF might be much more effective with a small niche industry, whereas with something as big as the meat industry, maybe vegan outreach is the most effective tactic at this stage. So it's all, it's going to be a lot of combined factors that would, um, are going to uh, bring people to know what the best tactic is. Real terrorism, well, you know, I know it when I see it. I know. Um, what real terrorism looks like because I've been to egg farms and I've looked at these animals and you know those animals are terrorized. Uh, there's no question about it when you, you can look in their eyes and know it. So terrorism to me is you know taking the liberty of another creature, um, um, forcing a creature into a cage, inflicting physical suffering on that creature um, without provocation. That is. I can't think of a better definition of terrorism than, than an egg farm or a, or a laboratory. Um, so that's terrorism to me. And then anything that people do to stop that is counter-terrorism. In the U.S., we talk a lot about how easy you have it in Europe comparatively to the U.S. Because in the U.S., um, there's this sense of despair with every campaign. Even small, winnable campaigns or winnable campaigns that are for very small in against small industries. There's this sense that the problem is just too big. I mean, even with the fur industry, which is one of the smallest animal abuse industries we have, there's still about 300 fur farms, feed suppliers. It's, like, it's just, there's always this sense that you can never ever win because the problem is too big, because the country's too big. But in Europe, um, when you look at the list of laboratories, you look at the list of, 
of slaughterhouses, um, the scale of it is so much smaller than what we have in the U.S. And you have, at least it's my perception, you have as many people, if not more, people fighting for animals over here. So what you have in the Europe is so much more winnable than what we have in the, in the U.S. And I think it's important before people in Europe get disempowered to consider how much harder we have in the U.S. If I wanted to take out every slaughterhouse in the state of California, I would probably have to be out every night for months and months and months and months burning down slaughterhouses because there's hundreds. Um, whereas you might only have one or hundred slaughterhouses in an entire country in Europe um, or less. So people really should, I think in Europe, I would really try to push perspective on people and show people how much harder other countries have it, other continents. I was talking tonight about how in my experience there's always a way in to any building and how even as a very young activist, you know, 18, 19, when I, we would stand outside of a building that we had our mindset on, we almost always found a way in. And a lot of times that just came from just putting ourselves there um, outside of a building and just staring at it with a totally blank mind. And we would see things. We'd see, okay, second floor window seems to be open a little bit. There's a, there's a, a pole that leads up to the second floor window. We could shimmy up the pole. So that, things like that will just come to you. But you have to put yourself in that physical place. Um, put yourself in a place where you allow those things to happen. Um, and, but in my experience, um, almost every time I wanted to get inside of a place, I got in. One of the ways you can overcome fear is to demystify it and, and challenge fear in your everyday life. And you know that could be something as simple as picking one thing every day that you fear and doing it. Whether it's skateboarding through the supermarket, whether it's um, sn you know sneaking into the Gwen Stefani concert. You know, I mean, there's any number of things you could do to challenge fear, but. I think it's important to realize that fear is something that usually happens in anticipation of something. Fear is a response to a mental image that you create in your head of something that you perceive to be a threat. It's very rarely a response to the thing itself. And I talked about how I would, you know, I would be driving to fur farms and I would fear on the drive to the fur farms getting shot by a fur farmer. But when I was on the fur farm, I didn't fear that. I feared prison before I went to prison, but when I was in prison, I didn't fear prison. So fear is an anticipatory response, an anticipatory emotion. And so I would force people to realize that in the moment where you have, where you have a, a task to do, there's very, very rarely fear. I believe that the government and the media has placed a cop inside the heads of all of us. And it's that, that cop that tells us, you know, don't say this, don't do that, um, don't break the law, or, or, or not even just don't break the law, but don't create any friction, don't rock the boat. And that cop in our head that, that polices us much more than all the police in the world could ever do. You know, it's like they don't have to police all of us individually if, we, if they put a cop in our head and have us all policing ourselves. And so I think it's important to identify that voice in your head, the voice of the cop, and kill it. Um, and I don't mean be reckless. I mean realize when it's a cop in your head and not a reasoned you know, risk assessment. And I think that's what people need to do. Well, in this particular instance, I don't know exactly how the law is changing, mm -hmm. but um, I think it's going to be very difficult to, if everybody holds their ground, it's going to be very difficult to, to arrest everybody who's squatting. And I, I, this is my first day in Europe, so all of my, most of my knowledge is coming from the last you know, 16 hours. So it's hard for me to, to know how to respond to that um, exactly. Um, but I would imagine they can't arrest everybody, and I think you know, hopefully people will hold their ground. This is something I guess on the broader level I think is really important that people should always wait for the government to follow through on their threats before they get scared. Um, anybody can make a threat. You know they're saying October this law is going to change um, but my understanding is that nobody knows if it will be enforced. So you know whereas in the US you have laws like the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act um, and there's a lot of fear around that and um, I was always telling people wait for them to follow through on their threat to charge people for legal activity, which they have now. Um, but it's still not quite a, a full-blown threat they followed through on because they haven't convicted anybody yet. So I think it's important, you know, especially in, in this case with the squatter's law changing, um, before you panic, um, you know, wait for them to follow through on their threat and, and maybe that day will never come.